So welcome everybody. Uh, we are going to begin with Jason, Jason Winston, who has offered classes on Musar in the past, and he's going to explain to you what Musar is, and he's going to give you some guidance on how to become better people, which is perfect for this time of year when we're trying to be better. Go ahead, Jason. So I think it's always nice to start with a centering. So I'm going to invite you to close your eyes <clears throat> and find yourself a comfortable spot. And the goal here is just to focus on slow, deep breaths. And as you breathe in, just open yourself up to what you can learn, where you can grow, be receptive. And as you breathe out, push out what you were doing before this, what you have going later, whatever distractions you might have that keep you from being here and present. And as you're focusing on those cycles of breath, starting from the top of your head, just check in with each part of your body and ask, are you feeling any tension there? And as you exhale, push out any tension that you might be feeling. <clears throat> Just start with your head and your face. And relax any of those muscles that feel tense. Move down into your neck and your shoulders. Move through your torso. Feel yourself grounded on your seat and instruct those muscles that are supporting you in your seat to relax down into your legs. Make your way down all the way to your toes. Feel your feet comfortable and grounded and centered. And while you're relaxing and while you're doing this, I'm going to read a visualization to you. <clears throat> and this will take a few minutes. So I invite you to open your mind to be receptive to what's here. <clears throat> you're Imagine a source of water. It could be a tap or a little rivulet coming out from a rock or a bit of overflow coming over a wall. Get that scene fully formed in your mind. See the water dripping very slowly from its source. Is there moss along the wall? Is there a steady rhythm to the drip, drip, drip? Now look down in your imagination to see that the water is falling onto a large rock. Already, the steady dripping has eroded a small indentation in the rock. One drip hits the little pool of water, then another, then another. See the water flow gently and insistently onto the rock. With the extraordinary sight of which your imagination is capable, see that each drop of water has the effect of knocking loose the tiniest fragment of sand from the surface of the rock, no more than a molecule or two. Then another drop, and another molecule of sand, and another drop, and another molecule of sand, then another drop, and another molecule of sand flies away. Imagine that these moments have strung together one by one until they occupy a whole day, a whole week, a whole month a whole year, and after a whole year has passed, can you see that the surface of the rock has eroded at least a millimeter? But then another year passes, and another, and another, until a thousand years have passed. And there, see, in the center of your rock, a hole has been carved all the way through, wrought by the drip, drip, drip of the water. This 
spend a few moments visualizing this scene and the transformation of the rock. Take your time to really let the images become vibrant in your mind. Try to hold this thought for yourself that you can return to it whenever you need to be reminded of what's possible with a drip of water and a rock. And then I would invite you when you're ready to open your eyes and So I always like to take a minute and just see if anybody has any thought that came to them or any uh, anything that that visualization prompted for you. You're muted, Rabbi. Yeah, I guess one thing is that it's gentle transformation. It's not you know, radical or uh, violent transformation. It's very gentle. Okay. <clears throat> well, I have prepared a little slideshow to guide us through this. And as I said before, I'm really hoping that much of what happens today comes from you. But I'm going to just try to give you some, some guidance on what, what's possible here. Um, okay. And is everybody able to see the slideshow? Okay. I'm going to try to go back and forth so that we're looking at each other from time to time because I think that's really important. So I guess it's a reasonable question to start because some of you may or may not have had exposure to what this idea is. So I'm just going to share a few things to give you an idea of what some people say Musar, some say Musar, some say, I, I usually say Musar. Uh, it's, it's probably all correct. It just depends on where you're from. Um, so this is a quote from, um, from Alan Marinus's Everyday Holiness, just to give you a simple definition as a spiritual perspective and also uh, a discipline of transformative practices. It is a Jewish spiritual path of study and practice, and the goal is to lead to awareness, wisdom, and transformation. Uh, the texts that we use date back, you know, a good thousand years in some cases, but almost all of them, let's see, I need to shrink my viewing up here what I'm seeing because it's blocking my screen. Uh, the texts almost always will derive their inspiration from the Tanakh and the Talmud. Uh, so if you actually read any primary Musar texts at any point, you will see many, many, many quotes. And what we refer to as the modern Musar movement um, began in the 1800s, and it was organized in Lithuania by the Rabbi Yisrael Salanter. And there's a great story that Rabbi read it's in our Rosh Hashanah book, and I think it's worth, um, she read this during the evening service the other night, but I'm just going to read it again because it's the piece that I hope gives you some of the inspiration of what, where he came from, why he felt this was such a critical thing to believe in and to devote his life to. Rabbi Israel Salanter once spent the night at a shoemaker's home. Late at night, he saw the man working by the light of a flickering candle. Look how late it is, the rabbi said. Your candle is about to go out. Why are you still working? The shoemaker replied, as long as the candle is burning, it is still possible to mend. For weeks afterward, Rabbi Salanter was heard repeating the shoemaker's words to himself. As long as the candle is burning, it is still possible to mend. As long as the candle burns, as long as the spark of life still shines, we can mend and heal, seek forgiveness and reconciliation, begin again. 
And I would hope that you've taken note at some point during various services, there was quite a lot of what you'll see today came from or is referenced in the Rosh Hashanah service, the Yom Kippur service, the Slihot service, um, and a lot of our regular prayers that we do every Friday night have a lot of these terms and words in them. It's just a matter of whether or not you're putting them into a, a framework that you're using for personal growth. So the word that is most often used when we are talking about um, Musar work is, is the midot. And uh, we we call midot is plural, midah is singular, and these are different character traits. And we focus on, excuse me, we focus on them generally one at a time so that we can really have self-awareness and 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 make an improvement in a specific trait one at a time. So we'll do midah work or work on our midot. Um, the word basically translates as measure. Um, you should note that every one of these traits exists in all of us, and the degree is what differs. And it doesn't just matter from person to person, but also matters from situation to situation or relationship to relationship. You might always be patient with certain people and not so patient with other people. And that means that patience isn't a consistency. It's something that you have a measure of in different situations. That's okay. The whole goal is just to develop awareness so that you can focus in on where you feel like you want to do things differently or where you can draw strength from where you do it well and apply it to situations that you don't do it as well. Uh, and and most are generally will say there's no good or bad nido. There's There are some that you will think, well, how can that be bad? But there's always an extreme where you're taking it too far. I mean, even say love can be taken to an extreme to where <clears throat> you stop doing anything for yourself because you're only committed to loving other people so much that you neglect yourself or you smother another person and give them no space. Uh, you know, it, it can go far enough or too far, I guess. And when we talk about in Musar, we talk about a curriculum, a spiritual curriculum, which is generally the combination of the midot that challenge you the most. We don't necessarily worry about the ones that we're doing well in, um, but what are the ones that we realize are where we need to work on things? So I put up a list here of some examples of some of the midot. This is a partial list. There are a lot. Um, I, since I know all of you come to a lot of services, see a lot of prayers, I think you will see that a lot of these Hebrew words appear quite often in things we do. Um, you know, chesed is in, you know, gimilut chesedim, it's the same root for loving kindness. Rachamim, we have prayers about God's compassion. Um, you know, um, there are, the givarot is one of our prayers, that's strength, givura. Slicha, we had the holiday, slichot. So hopefully these are familiar uh, terms in some way or shape or form. And there is sort of a Musser definition of each of these. But what I would like you to do is just look at this list and pick one or two that jump out to you and just kind of settle those in your mind as ones that you want to be thinking about right now. And we'll come back to this if you need to. Um, I just want to give you a minute to. What's calling to you? What words jump off this page to you right now? You want us to answer? Oh, we'll have a little discussion in just a second. Yes, um, but I'm going to kind of uh, get you there. Um, so you may have seen this term in the prayer book, Heshbon Hanefesh. Uh, it translates to accounting of the soul, nefesh being soul. So here's the first one that I would like to open up for a small bit of discussion, which is, is there one change I would like to make in the way I am living my life and relating to other people? And I would open this to all of you. 
is there any one of those traits that jumped out at you that this speaks to where you are right now in your life? Well, I'll answer that the trait that I, I always want to work on at every high holiday is savlanut, which is patience, which yeah. you do not have a lot of. And you will be tested every high holidays because nothing will go perfectly. That's for sure. <laughs> That's kind of the definition of life, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the reason that I like to encourage people to think about how this can help you is it's a guarantee that your patients will be tested again. It's not guaranteed that you'll have done anything between now and then so that the next time it goes easier. And the reason that you commit to doing the work is because at some point you want your reaction to be more towards your ideal than it is currently in whatever it is. And that for some people are too patient and they'll just let people trample all over them. And, you know, and, and they need to store up some strength to push back and say, I've been waiting for you all day. And that's not, that's not good. But some people also need to have the ability to stop and take that deep breath before that impatience bubbles over. And none of these things generally happen by accident, but that's what the drip, drip, drip on the rock is hopefully supposed to inspire in you is that if you work on it and if you encounter it enough times, you will notice the change be, becomes apparent later. It's not instant, but it does work. My problem is patience too. So I have a question, Jason. Of course. Not that you're a psychotherapist, but okay. So <laughs> nor is most of psychotherapy, but yes. Right. But, okay. So I could not get impatient and just kind of hold it in or count to 10 or something. But then instead of being sort of unkind to another person, I'm being unkind to myself because it's eating up inside me. So how do you get to the point where you're not doing it to someone else or to yourself. Well, that's a complicated question. And here's what I would say is that in, in the Musser study I've done, there tends to be in various places um, focus on three relationships, your relationship with others, your relationship with yourself and your relationship with God. And all of these come up in all of these traits in some way, shape or form, right? I mean, God is referred in some of our prayers as infinitely patient, right? That we humiliate, we sin, we do all these things, and God bears all of it. Um, and so if we are asked to walk in the footsteps and, and emulate the characteristics of God, and that is an inspiring tool for you, then it can stop kind of being about even other people or you and become entirely about doing it because it's the godly thing that you want to embody and you find a way to make that inspire you. But for many of us, that is not the relationship we have with God, and it is not the way that we frame things. And we have to look at it from, I just want to treat myself better. I'll, I'll, and you know that's maybe what's more primary. And nobody can really answer that for you. I mean, and maybe it's about how you're handling relationships with other people. If you're finding that it's causing problems in other relationships and that the awareness comes to you, then maybe the focus for a while is on not offending other people and taking it on yourself a little bit and seeing how that works. But nobody can answer any of these things for you. Um, but you can try all of them and see if any of them help um, and see if any of them stick, because you never know. The guarantee is that you'll be tested again. And that's the reality, right? Uh, the only thing that remains to be written is how you'll respond the next time so thank you <laughs> all right let's look at one more so these might be familiar to you because i think all of you probably attended this slihot service and i took these directly from some questions that were in the slihot service that as soon as i read them i said aha this is what we're going to be talking about so we talk about accounting of the soul so when i look over my accounts what do i see which personal qualities need repair and strengthening? Which have what habits of mind, character, and behavior need correction? So, other than patience, I would love if each of you would just 
take a second maybe and share any other quality that jumped out at you as one where you feel you could do some work. Since no one else is speaking, I'll speak up again. Um, I think I'm too self-critical. Um, so that's something I need to uh, repair. So that's and, one of those relationships with yourself, yes. And also, you know, comparing myself to other people, like, oh, look at that rabbi and all the acclaim that person's getting. How come I'm not in that position myself? Which I know is ridiculous. And I, I tell people all the time, don't compare yourself to anyone else. But hey, you know, it doesn't mean I follow my own advice. It's much easier to give other people advice. It definitely is. And, and it's sometimes, and I will admit to this, it's sometimes it's hard to be happy for someone else's success, even when you want to be. Um, and we all can fall victim to that. Ruth, Lynn, would you like to share a, a characteristic that you look at and say, this is one I want to work on? Uh, well, the patience also, but sort of goes with the patience's anger at times, things that anger you and relates to why you're not very patient on occasion and how to deal with that. <laughs> People involved. No, um, absolutely. Overall, there's not a lot of anger, just in certain situations there is. Yeah. And we all have it. There's absolutely nobody who doesn't occasionally have that match lit. Um, so the question is just, what are you going to do? There's a there's another visualization that's common in, in, in these things when you're talking about anger, which is, you talk about separating the distance between the match and the fuse. So you picture a stick of dynamite and fuse is here and you your match is lit. I can guarantee your match will get lit by something. Something is going to anger you, okay? It's just a question of, do you let the match ignite the stick and blow up, you know? Um, you know, when they say the phrase, lose it, right? When you When you get angry, you lose it. Well, what do you lose? Well, you probably lose control of your words and your actions and you cause harm that you then regret and then have to ask forgiveness for. Well, wouldn't it be better if you could somehow just create a little extra space between the match and the fuse and not cause the incident and just find a way to let the match gently blow out and then move on? I'm not saying it's going to happen all the time, but if it happens even once, it could help a relationship. When you've been one way for 89 years, it's very difficult to, to change sometimes. I've never oh. been a patient person. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> and I will tell you, Susie, no one expects it to be easy. And that's why a lot of people don't want to do this kind of work on themselves because it is hard and because it does ask a lot of you. Uh, and the, the only starting point that I can offer is if you really want it, you'll do it. If you really want to be to change. I when I first started working in Musa groups, I there's a couple that did facilitating together and they were out in the, um, uh, the Agura Oak Park area. And one of them had a um, parent who lived in an assisted living mm -hmm. and the parent had expressed interest in having them come and facilitate classes at their home. Mm -hmm. And they started doing it there. The average age of the people in the group was, I think, 92. Mm -hmm. And they went week after week after week and worked with this group of people. And they said it was the best group mm -hmm. they ever had. And they loved it. And they went back for mm -hmm. years. And, you know, I'll be honest, sometimes they said, sometimes people forgot what they'd done the week before, because yeah. that'll happen. But a lot of people felt that they were remarkably finding themselves making changes in their 90s that they didn't think were possible, but they they wanted to have better relationships with their children or their grandchildren right. or someone in their life. And 
they found it in themselves. So there is no too late. No, we'll try. <laughs> Ruth, did you have one that you wanted to share? You're, you you're muted. It. Come off mute, mute, Ruth, so we can hear you. <laughs> I'm trying. Ruth, you're muted. We can't hear you. I'm mute myself. We're a pretty small group. You don't have to if you don't want to. I'm not going to get a lot. Oh, I unmuted. No, I find sometimes I uh, people complain because I accept everyone the way they are, and I don't try to change them. Even if I disagree with them, I'm not a fighter to change the world. That may be, I mean, I feel the only one I have any control over is myself. And so I try to just do what I can myself and uh, haven't been too critical of a lot of people that I do disagree with. And some of my friends say to me, how can you talk to these people with the things that they do and they think that, they... but I said, listen, it's their problem. And some of them are good people, even though I disagree with them, especially politically. So I don't know, it just seems to work for me. I mean, it's uh, over the years, I've gone through many, many different things and I just find trying to accept what I have and appreciate it is the best way I can live my life. And I'm not gonna try to tell you not to do that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I mean, a lot of what Masur is is about looking at your qualities and deciding which ones you feel need change and which don't. And if and not judging other people, I think is actually quite admirable. That's probably one of your strengths. And so maybe what people who work these things would say is, so you use that and maybe use that as a strength to ask yourself, well, do I judge myself harshly? Maybe I need to be kinder to myself the way I'm kinder to not judging other people. Maybe there's another area where that strength can help you in some other aspect. Or maybe there's just nothing that you feel you're trying to change. And that's OK, too. Um, no, there's, there are always things to change. I mean, for so many years, both Arne and I were so very active in doing all kinds of things with the temple. I worked you know, a long time with high cap health insurance you know, where I was licensed. And now I don't do it because I just feel at this stage, uh, you know, Susie and I have talked about it. Mm. You know, we try just to not get into anyone else's life and not bother them and, and do the best we can managing what we can ourselves. And uh, so I feel badly that, you know, I'm not helping Lynn on the Victoria cleanup and mm -hmm. all the stuff that yeah. I would have done in the past. But uh, um, and even, you know, Eileen Stein, you know, who goes, uh, you know, and I will get stuff together, but I'm not running, you know, to uh, uh, feed the hungry and, you know, which I should probably be doing as long as I still can walk and stuff. But I figured I want to try to stay out of trouble. Um, yeah. so You're never like in trouble, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I, I admire that you've done the the introspection, Ruth, that that's what's, I think, the goal here. So I wanted to show you another little reading. Um, this comes right out of our, um, out of the Mishkan Hanefesh, that is our high holiday prayer book. And in this case, I'm looking straight at pieces from the, the Yom Kippur book. And I put a few in here just to kind of, as you go into Yom Kippur this week, these are some of the things that are actually in our book and are there for you to be thinking about during the service as it goes along. Um, so on page 354, it talks about the heart of Yom Kippur afternoon is tikkun midot hanefesh, often called tikkun midot, repairing and strengthening the personal qualities and traits that enable us to fulfill our urge to be good. Virtues such as love, self-discipline, gratitude, and forgiveness. And there are quite a lot of supplemental readings. And there are times when I, Rabbi leaves space for private and silent prayer. And <clears throat> I would urge you to look at some of the 
<clears throat> some of the teachings that are in here. Some of them I'm putting up here as, um, and you'll see over the next couple slides. Mm -hmm. But if you have a few minutes and you're just in quiet mode, um, there's a lot of really interesting things that focus on this that are right there in the book. So there's actually several sections uh, in that part of the service, and, and Rabbi is going to use some of this, but not as much in this depth as the book offers. Um, chesed or loving kindness, there's a section on reflecting on chesed, and here's how it defines it in part. And this is not the easiest term, but I think I think we all intuitively understand what loving kindness entails. And I think we know um, whether or not it is something that we put into the world as much or not as much as we would like to. Uh, the word hesed, as used in the Bible, does not refer to a single one-way expression of kindness or mercy. The essence of hesed is mutual loyalty and allegiance between human beings or between human beings and God. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is best understood within the context of reciprocal rights, responsibilities, and duties. So if you think about loving kindness as a responsibility, I think that frames it a little differently. Some of us might think of it as just something you do when you feel like it, but if it's a responsibility and a duty, then it's something we need to be thinking about mm -hmm. all the time. Um, and I'm going to put up a couple of reflective things for us to discuss. So who are my own models of chesed? And how have I sought to emulate them during this past year? And again, this is actually right in the book. Um, in the There's a reflection on each of these characteristics. Um, so when you think of the world and the people around you, is there somebody who you see as embodying kindness in a way that you would like to be closer to that model? Well, I know the rabbi is and Ruth. Of kindness. That is very I, kind of you, but you are definitely a model of it, Susie. Oh, <laughs> I, no, I remember. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of these people are no longer alive, but you used to call all these people all the time. Yeah. yeah. Not to deny that Ruth or Jason or Lynn are not equally uh, examples. Susie is amazing. She is truly amazing. Okay. For so yes. many people over so many years, and I've been around long enough to see it all. I mean, this has been her case, that's, you know, with everyone. She really has been. I agree with you, Rabbi. Susie that's true. Is, I didn't say that she was the only you. Ruth. I didn't say she was the only one. I just said she is an example. You are as well. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you, Rabbi. I don't agree. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my mother was a good one, and as is my daughter. I. Uh, my daughter, Karen, she is a wonderful model for me. A person in our congregation I look to as a model, this is Randy Lester Wilson. I yes. see just yes. he yeah. is yes. a person Absolutely. who is our first Absolutely. in every Definitely. Church. I mean, I certainly he's not the he, only one, but I, I hope he watches so he can hear him himself. Randy yeah. and Ryan have been amazing. Yes. And what about Carol Lee? Oh, yeah. Carol Lee. Oh, that is, she is. <laughs> She's way up there. Right. Now, Carol Lee is my model for Zero yeah, yeah. enthusiasm. She is the one who puts, just keeps marching, marching, marching right. forward with, with energy and excitement and zest. Um, we, we are so blessed in this community, Jason, and, we, right. and with Lynn, you know, with so many wonderful people. I, uh, and I think that's why Susie and I hang in there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, a lot of our friends have made changes. We sort of, as long as we can, um, you know, have decided, mm. you know, this is what we want to be as part of the community. Uh, well, before I go on to the next one, I just want to say, you know, the reason we talk about the people who we admire in a characteristic is if we see that they go one step further than we go occasionally and we want to use that, it can be inspirational. And so part of what most are encourages you to do is to look at people you see being positive or negative models of of a characteristic and using that as some kind of inspiration um, i didn't mean to cut off discussion of good people <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of them in this community we're very blessed 
So another trait that um, that there's a whole section on in our book is givura. It it sometimes it's got the apostrophe in there. Sometimes it's with the G E. Um, but I'll I'll show you here. This is a a a, a definition that's in our text, and um, it says the quality of givura may be understood as strength, justice, severity, discipline, and will. Reflecting on Gavura offers us an opportunity to contemplate the way we set limits for ourselves and the way we judge ourselves and others. And these are sh not the fullest definition of what all these things are, but I'm trying to give you some framework sort of understanding. Um, uh, so the Gavu wrote is, is a prayer. It was all it's all about God's strength and also God's severity. God is sometimes um, restrained in uh, in our stories in the Torah, and sometimes God does not um, hold back in disciplining. <laughs> so it can work both ways. There is severity, but there's also the strength not to always punish. And we look at those both sides of that. Mm. With, with, in, in, I'm sure Rabbi could tell us a hundred stories where this <laughs> comes up, but I'm not putting you on the spot. Um, so this is another one of these ask yourselves. And, and the reason that I'm putting these like this is because it's, this season is supposed to be about this type of reflection. It is supposed to be where we look at where do we measure up to the le level that we want to be at, or where do we see a place where we can do some work? So this one is one to think about. Is my judgment of other people harsh and without compassion? Well, Jason, I'll say one thing um, that there's a story in the Talmud about God asking, I think it's Elijah or somebody for a blessing. And let's say it's Elijah says, well, what what would you like to be blessed with? He said, Please help me make my compassion overcome my judgment. So God is always balancing out judgment and compassion. It's, it's a tough one. Because if you have too much of one, too much, you know, judgment, then the world is is really cold and fierce. And if it's too much compassion, then, you know, there are no limits and people don't act responsibly. So it's a really hard balance and even God struggles with it. That's great. Yeah, that is, that is, that is spot on. And I'm sure, you know, I'm not a parent, so, but I'm, you know, the rest of you are, and I'm sure that's something you've struggled with in terms of bringing up your children. You know, how, how often do you impose, you know, harsh punishment and how often do you let the kid get away with something because you understand, you know, I mean, you can understand what, where someone's coming from and then feel like they don't deserve punishment. But, you know, how do you, how do you balance all that out with your kids? I know my parents leaned in the direction of punishment. Yeah. That, of punishment? That generation. So did mine. So did mine. And I think this generation and the one before it, you know, was much more, you know, about understanding where the kid's coming from and supporting the kid and being who they are, as opposed to, you know, you need to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever. Yeah, right. <laughs> And who's to say which is the better? It's all a balance in some, but yes, you're probably right that as society, we've swung the balance dr dramatically towards the compassion side. Whether or not that's good remains to really be seen, right? You know? But I think also picking up on what Ruth was saying before about accepting people. I mean, mm. part of where we are in our society right now is that we don't have any compassion for the other side. We just, you know, look at them as, as evil and don't. You know, if you possibly support this person over that person, then you must be a terrible person yourself, right? And as Ruth said, you know, there are plenty of people with different political positions who are perfectly lovely people. And we've gotten away from being able to be compassionate towards each other and to accept difference. I don't know if any of you have watched yet the PBS documentaries on the U.S. and the Holocaust. Yes, um, I did. But... Um, you know, there is so much there that um, I feel like it could 
have been exactly the same today. Like nothing's mm -hmm. changed in um, yep. 90, 100 years. The, the, we just don't learn. The yep. anti-immigrant language, it's yep. the same language. It's the yep. same yep. intolerance. It's the same lack of compassion. Right. And it's, it's, you know, that means that some of these same people have been teaching intolerance for a hundred years in yeah. their generation to generation yeah. that we end up having the same things repeated. And I can bet you that it's a lot of the great grandparents of today's people who were saying those things in the 1920s. Um, and, and that's the part that I find just hard to not judge. I mean, yep. I am right. very judgmental about people whose behavior yeah. I find to be abhorrent. <laughs> and maybe I shouldn't hold back on that judgment. Maybe it's right. Uh, you know, I I, I want to honor each person as being capable of better, but when they show themselves repeatedly not to be better, it's very hard not to say, well, you've shown me who you are. Well, you can't show compassion to Putin. <laughs> but in the news, we always see that Mm. You know, and that's what we're exposed to more than, I mean, Susie and I were out yesterday and, and somebody was just so kind and so careful when they saw we were having some difficulty. Mm. Uh, so many good people around that we don't give credit to. Right. Well, that's the thing with media and especially with social media. Yeah. It really underlines the differences and the outrage because that's the clickable stuff, right? The more outraged you are, the more clicking you're going to do, the more ads you're going to see. It's unfortunately their business model. But that does not encourage us to see each other as human beings. I guess that's why I'm not on any social media. Well, you're smart. <laughs> I'm not either, I'm actually. Smart. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. I Good do strategy. know what's going on. I know yeah. the world is in a lot of trouble. And I agree with uh, Susie about Putin. Very scary because, you know, mm -hmm. Trump. So, you know, it's a, it's a really difficult time. So I want to just give you one other framing of, of Gavura, which is looking inward. Um, is my self-criticism and severity helpful or harmful? So we talked about how some of these relationships are with others, some are with ourselves. Um, the, the, the strength and severity we show to our, and discipline we show to ourselves can be possibly more or less than it should be. So this is another reflection point. I mean, some people don't criticize themselves enough, right? We can think of a couple of examples, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, it's again a balance, right? That's what this whole thing's about, is balancing all the different me dope so it's not too much of one or too much of the other and it all starts with awareness and that's why the idea of accounting of the soul the cheshvan hanefesh is that you actually do some of the work of making notes i mean of actually looking at what you're doing in the world and ruth you said earlier you know you cannot change other people and that's totally true um and but you Can do have try, power and some yourself. people do try and i think that is a strength mm -hmm. i don't I give them credit for that. I mean, you know, I think our rabbi tries to mm. get people to change. <laughs> I think it's something where you can put it out there, but they have to take some steps at some point. Right. Uh, and, and this sort of work is designed to encourage those who have had just enough push that makes them say, okay, I want to do something. I'm not sure what it's going to be yet, but mm -hmm. I want to push myself a little bit. Anything else on, uh, on Gavura? I, I have one more set of slides to show. All right. Forgiveness, which comes up quite a bit. We had an interesting discussion about this at the Slehoat service. Mm -hmm. um, and our text has something to say about it. it and this is, this, there's a very long, very long reading uh, page or so, um, trying to get at what some of the different reflections in 
Jewish thought are related to forgiveness. It is not a simple thing, but I'm going to try to give you a piece of it here. One kind of forgiveness is an act of the heart. It is reaching a deeper understanding of the sinner. It is achieving an empathy for the troubledness of the other. <clears throat> Slicha, forgiveness too, is not a reconciliation or an embracing of the offender. It is simply reaching the conclusion that the offender too is human, frail, and deserving of sympathy. It is closer to an act of mercy than to an act of grace. Well, what's interesting about this is it, it's um, not a, it's not a reconciliation or embracing. In other words, it's allowing the offender to take responsibility for what they've done without condemning them as a human being and understanding that people act in ways that are not so wonderful because of issues that they're dealing with themselves. And again, it doesn't mean, okay, you're off the hook and you don't need to you know, do any kind of uh, teshuva. It just means I understand that you can't be a perfect person at all moments. And the question <laughs> about harboring feelings of anger yes. and resentment is how much room it takes in your head to continue being angry at someone. Yes, that is, um, that is the, that is the next, point. Uh, so yes, when we are reflecting here, is there somebody, and this is something you'll each have to look at yourself, is there somebody you're harboring feelings of anger and resentment for right now? Is there someone who has a hold on you, who has a grip on your mind or your heart? Yes. Can't think of anyone. You can't? Mm. Good. <laughs> Well, you're you're evolved. <laughs> Only you know. No, I'm saying is that I, I can't I, control either. You know, I certainly uh, feel anger and resentment now against a lot yes. of people, mainly well, in the leadership of yes. uh, right. the country. Me too. Not so much the individuals. And and I those people I bear anger with I can't forgive I'm sorry I can't forgive Hitler I can't forgive Putin and you don't have to yeah some things are unforgivable yeah and they didn't ask for forgiveness and they didn't do any teshuva so no they're killing people babies oh it's terrible, terrible. yeah it's terrible. I mean you know in Jewish tradition you have to ask forgiveness three times you know after that you're what they say yotze meaning you're you're off the hook but uh if you haven't even done that there's no reason you should forgive people you should just not let it eat up your insides that's all oh and that's the part that's the act of the heart it's 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 because you don't want to carry around that hatred anymore it's because even though the person may have earned it and will never ask for you to stop <laughs> that you don't want to live with that resentment and anger in your heart anymore. And you feel it weighing you down. If that's not the case, then you're doing great. But for yeah. many people, we have been hurt and we've been hurt unforgivably. And yet, if we want to move forward with as open a heart as possible, it helps if we can find a place to push that so that it doesn't keep us from being able to be open-hearted to the next person we want to be because mm -hmm. we're afraid of being hurt again or because we can't get over the hurts that have happened. And so this is a very personal thing and it's very personal to the individual situations that mm -hmm. you experience, um, whether you know one person or I mean, some people can't talk to their whole family because of hurt. You know, I mean, there's just so many levels where this can be and often the person who has done something to us is gone and they're never going to come back and ask for forgiveness uh so what do you do with that well i know one option is you just let it eat up at you and that's not the one that i particularly like um not saying it's easy to do it any other way but it is worth knowing that there are 
people who believe it's possible that it doesn't continue to hold you that way. I think I've got one more thought here. Oh, that's it. What is holding me back from being a more forgiving person? I think it's that, for me anyway, it's that sense of justice. Like, this is not right. And therefore, I cannot forgive you until you realize how unjust your behavior is. So, and since so many people don't realize they're being unjust or whatever it is they're being, it's hard to forgive them. And they haven't asked for forgiveness, right? I mean, if somebody really comes to you and is really, really aware of what the herd is and really serious about not doing it again, mm. which is real teshuva according to Maimonides, it's a lot easier to forgive them than if they're persisting in the behavior. Mm. Or if they say, I'm sorry, but they just do it right all over again. I didn't say this was easy. Because <laughs> 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 most people won't do that. Right. Most people won't have that act of tissue. Hmm. Um, right, they won't. Most people don't want to confront their own faults or frailties, you know? Your ego is there to pump you up. Well, justifying your anger is a great way of saying you're held back from forgiveness. I mean, if you feel the righteousness of your response, and you let that overwhelm you. And, and I think we see that just all the time in society right. right now is people feel that what they did was right and therefore they don't ever even consider the idea of seeking forgiveness for it. Mm -hmm. They are so justified in their actions, they don't care who they hurt in them. Um, that's, I think, a somewhat of a disease of our society today. Like some politicians. Yeah. And the people who follow them, unfortunately. Um, they believe it doesn't matter who gets hurt along the way as long as they achieve their goal. Right. And that is, I believe, my last slide. So I'm going to, I was trying to figure out how much we were likely to have time to talk through. And um, well, we did pretty well. It's close to an hour. Um, so I'm, I, I didn't want to go through every one of the things that's in the prayer book, but I wanted to give you some food for thought and to see what some of the ideas here. If um, if you're interested in some kind of other future way of using what Musar has to offer, or if you just want to spend a little more time between now and Yom Kippur in contemplation of some of these things, it's all good. You know, for everybody, this is your individual journey. And um, you know, Alan Marinus, the teacher who guided me in Musser, he says, um, this is the work of the lifetime, and that's why we've been given the lifetime to do the work. Mm. Uh, it is not yeah. it is not instant. It's not an instant gratification type of thing. Uh, but I can tell you that I started studying with him some 15 years ago, and mm. I'm a lot more patient than I used to be. I'm a lot more tolerant than I used to be. I think I'm more generous and I have more gratitude than I used to have. Mm. Uh, and there's still a lot of areas where I need work. <laughs> well, you know, no actually, one is perfect. We all it's need a, work. <laughs> when you talk about, you know, you have a whole lifetime to do this, it makes me think of this film I watched last night. It's called The Last Flight Home. And um, me, I, I don't know where you can see it other than I, I could, you could sort of rent it last night and then it's showing in some movie theaters, but eventually it'll make it to TV. So The Last Flight to Home, and it was made by the sister of a rabbi I know. This is a, a rabbi named Rachel Timoner. Um, and basically what her sister did was follow her father during the last two weeks of his life. He decided to end his life with dignity, you know, by taking pills. He just had incredible, you know, uh, physical challenges and health challenges. He just couldn't do it anymore. Um, but it's interesting because she sat down with him to do a vidui, which is a confession before you die, and hmm. asking him what, you know, what he was holding on to that he needed to let go of. Hmm. And here he is, uh, you know, a week before dying, okay? And he says that he felt a lot of shame over his life because what happened was he was a very, very successful uh, businessman who 
created Air Florida eons ago, okay? And he did really, really well. And then he had a stroke and was in a wheelchair. And all of a sudden they made him leave his post. The board made him leave, which of course wouldn't happen today. But, and he, you know, he ended up being, having a really hard time making a living and do, you know, cause he was having trouble walking and one of his sides was paralyzed. And he had a lot of shame over all this stuff. And clearly from the, the film, I mean, his children, he has three children and his wife and his grandchildren absolutely adore him. And what Rachel was trying to show him was like, okay, you have that that you're carrying around. Look at all the <clears throat> love that's surrounding you. Yeah. And she gave a sermon. There was a little excerpt from her sermon about how it took him until the end of his life to realize that what really mattered and what he should base his own opinion of himself on wasn't the shame, but the love that he had from his family. So yeah, it took him a whole lifetime to get there. So Rabbi, is it available? You know, I, I have to find out because I'd love to show it um, for, I don't know. Oh yeah, because I'm doing a session on dying with dignity. The whole, you know, the, the law in California where you, you know, if you have like six months to live, you can end your life. And this would be a wonderful, wonderful kickoff. So I, I need to find out uh, how I can get, how I can get it to show it to the nation mm. because it's really a very powerful film. Um, but yeah, so we we have until the moment of our death to finally get it. Hopefully, it happens before. The, <laughs> you know. As I've always understood, the purpose of the Yom Kippur fast is to make you feel just a little bit of that sense of the possibility of the end, right? Is oh, absolutely. Like, as, as, as you get through that day and you feel the hunger, you feel what it might be like to be getting close. And so I think we are trying as a people to simulate this in a way to push you to have a few of these realizations before it's too late, right? Right, exactly. And that's, exactly. I think, what these reflections are all about. And that's why I'm grateful that this particular set of books explores this a little bit because it gives you a place to mm -hmm. find here while you're there or while you're you know going through the the action of the service um to reflect on why why are you here and and what is it that's um you know we get this as an opportunity every year right i mean the the, the holidays can be something you look forward to or not you can do work for them or not um but they're going to come and they're going to be there for you and i took the approach many years ago of saying okay i didn't always go I didn't always get stuff out of them, but I'm going to make it a, a pact to myself is just to go and mm. to be present for all of it as much as I possibly can every year and get as much out of it as I can. Because again, it's an opportunity, right? All of our holidays, all of our festivals, I mean, they all have some, there's something more than just the actions of it, right? There, there's there gotta be a reason, right? Why do we retell the Exodus story? What's valuable about that? Why do we, you know, dance around with the Torah? I mean, there has to be a reason. There has to be something that our people have learned over the generations that dancing with the Torah and bringing jo out joy, simcha, right? I mean, that we need to have joy and we need right. to have, sometimes we need an excuse to do it. Sometimes we need someone to play the Hava Nagila so that we'll dance. Yeah. But we're supposed to do it, right? Jason. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. This is a, yeah. a great yeah. session and really appropriate for right now. I, I told you once, Jason, that you should have been a rabbi. <laughs> You're not the only one. <laughs> you know something? Listen to the rabbi. It's never too late. Yeah, this exactly. Is exactly. Is it is never too late. And look, yeah. Rabbi Akiva didn't start studying until he was 40. So there you go. And in those days, they didn't live as long. So. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. Pay the bills while I'm in school. That's exactly. <laughs> yeah. So as I say, Gamar Hatimatova, may you be sealed for a good year, and we'll see you all on Tuesday evening. And if anyone wants to continue chatting, I, I I'm not in a rush. So if there's any questions you have that you didn't get to ask, I, I'm or if you just want to ask about anything related to this, I'm I'm open. Rabbi, you can stop the recording. I'm going to stop the recording. Okay. Um, Thank you.